manifestations of corruption that irritate the public. For, for example, the official expecting to be paid some undefined consideration before processing an application for a business license or the registration of a title to a property. The police or soldiers setting up a road toll in the middle of nowhere. Or the judge repeatedly postponing court hearings to till the arch of justice or more generally as a World Bank study puts it, the arbitrariness of the behavior of government officials with regard to the interpretation and application of laws and regulations. All these corrupt manifestations act as a capricious toll on doing business and economic competitiveness. Mr. Chairman, on the policy front, policy front, corruption creates policy uncertainty. Self-interest bias could rule out policies that might have the best economic and social outcomes. The authorities and the political leaders who set aside public interest and refuse to act on a critical policy commitment because of fear that it would not be without some loss of private advantage. In fact, corruption could be the reason why leaders may very well be unwilling to implement policies that could transform their economies for the better. Some analysts often take such behavior charitably as lack of political will or policy risk aversion. Supporters take it approvingly as prudence and political savvy. Private sector operators come to accept this as the normal way of doing business. And that accentuates the pressure they put on the guardians of, our, of the public purse. I think all that could be the manifestation of corrupt, corrupt, corrupt behavior. Ladies and gentlemen, corruption has a foul smell. And the public can sense it when it is there. They sense it in opulent lifestyles, large acquisitions of wealth, personal influence and power, and in outsized behavior and practices out of norm with the values of the society. And that reminds me of a very interesting policy discussion I had with a negotiating team of an African country some years ago. Mr. Chairman, I will not mention the name because the Chatham rule is not in effect here. I was then much younger and uh, quite an enthusiastic economist at the fund. Our counterparts insisted on their view that we could work with data that we found highly suspect and unacceptable. For a moment, there was unease around the table. So to defuse a tense situation, we appealed to the old saying, if you wash dirty clothes secretly in a river, you should be aware that the dirt can be seen downstream. And believe me, there was a good amount of dirt for all to see. Surely, 
plenty of dirty clothes in the form of unrecorded budgetary outlays, huge unrecorded budgetary outlays, had been washed out of the glare of the public, and the foul smell of corruption has escaped into the daily murmurings of the ordinary citizen. It is not surprising that the country ranks at the bottom end of the corruption perception scale. It is also mired in political instability, and its economic performance has been one of the major disappointments. It is poor, despite it being one of the richest countries in the world in terms of resource endowment. Mr. Chairman, Africa is a well-endowed continent, yet it, it, it is arguably the poorest continent on earth. It is difficult to understand this developmental, developmental antithesis. Poverty in the midst of plenty. Indeed, it is difficult to understand why countries in the African region have, been little, have seen little success than desired in developing the capacity to function effectively as developmental states. Several theories have been propounded to explain away Africa's slow development but I think they have not been decisive or convincing. They ra these range from weak policy, policy implementation, geography, culture, through poor governance and weak institutions. But surely a major factor has to be corruption. African countries are clustered predominantly at the bottom range of corruption perception scale and poor governance indicators, which is a consistent finding in Transparency International, World Bank Doing Business, and Afro Barometers Service. And remarkably, all public institutions are perceived to be highly corrupt or somewhat corrupt, including parliament, the presidency, the judiciary, the police, and business leaders. That is an excoriating judgment. Thankfully, thankfully, traditional rulers and religious leaders fare much better. Power to them. Africa's development experience and position at the bottom of the global com competition, com corruption perception scale after decades of nation building invariably raises several prominent questions. Could it be that Africa had a false start in nation building? Is it that the fierce competition for control and consolidation of political and economic power and, and the redistributive policies gave rise to predatory politics and a pattern of abuse of public trust with regard to public funds and to rent seeking was corruption not rooted in the political competition for control over distribution of resources and rents in the effort of leaders to consolidate executive power and national sovereignty in the early years of independent states. The centralization of authority and power to the exclusion of others interested in the running of the affairs of the state sowed so the seeds of predatory politics, paternalism, autocracy, 
limited accountability, and non-transparency. And I think also the potential for civil conflict. In short, did the leaders capture the state and foster corrupt practices of the sort that are prevalent today? This is evident, especially in countries where leaders act as kings, institutions are weak and inadequately functional. Freedom and civil participation are restricted and the playing field and the rules of the game tilt in favor of those well connected politically. It is a, it is a surprise that competition, co corruption is institutionalized and endemic in African states and, a, a cha and still a challenge to development. I mean, those are na nagging questions. And I, I, I do not intend to prosecute uh, the, our, our forebears. Mr. Chairman, power corrupts and corrupt guardians of the public press or public services is a potential force for economic destruction. For several decades, corruption was a taboo that was out of place in the dialogue on economic reform. Everyone knew it was a canker, but no one dared mention it for political correctness. Remarkably, a seminal publication by the World Bank that there is, and I quote, widespread perception that the machinery of government in Africa is appropriated by the elite to serve their own interests. And consequently, there was a crisis of governance, not a crisis of corruption. Subsequently, James Wilfrenson, the then president of the World Bank, who you may recall, Mr. Vice Chancellor, has delivered an agri Frisiac Regisberg Memorial Lecture here at, the, at this university, was frank enough to say, Call a spade a spade. The crisis in Africa is corruption. Mr. Chairman, good governance in public service should be no different from good governance in the private sector. Much like corporate board members, politicians and public officials to serve as agents employed by the people and paid with tax contributions for the sole obligation to protect national assets and invest prudently in the well-being of the people. After all, the real stakeholders of the society are the people. But corrupt political political authorities seem to behave, seem to have rather, seem to have other interests different from that of the society and often interpreted their contract in rather expansive terms, which gives rise to correct, corrupt behavior with little or no accountability. Corruption in government, government thrives where there is not a well-established norm of strong discipline and no effective countervailing surveillance over the, over the use of power. And it, is, it flourishes where there is little or no pressure from civil society to constrain the actions of public authorities let alone act, uh, compel them to be faithful to their oath of office. 
a good corporate governance model is very strict in enforcing accountability and protecting the assets of the share stakeholders, shareholders. It works well mostly because of the integrity of the participants in the principal agency relationship. Why should the governing principles of the model not serve that the state well in its relationship with, the, with its citizens as guardians of the rule of law and custodians of, the, of public assets? Mr. Chairman, it would appear that weak governance, weak governance system leading to high incidence of corruption has been a major factor in Africa's poor development experience. It tilted the balance of politics and economics and other factors towards a slow growth trajectory and prolonged the record of poor economic performance. Corruption, corruption thus remains the fundamental and existential threat to rapid and sustainable growth on the continent. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, all is not gloom. All is not gloom. It is fair to state that the narrative on Africa's development experience has changed dramatically in recent times. There is a general consensus that Africa's growth prospects have become optimistic. It is an assessment that is, that is shared by development policy analysts and practitioners, the development partners and the financial markets. Africa is regarded as a destination for business and no longer principally as the poster child for charity and the dark continent. This is good news. And there are good reasons for it. Over the last decade, African countries have seen significant improvement in economic performance and in the record of policy reforms across the region. The economic fundamentals are better. Growth rates have risen. They have averaged some three, some three percentage points faster than the, that recorded in advanced countries. And per capita incomes are rising as well after decades of stagnation. Economies are more open to trade, foreign direct and portfolio investment inflows and remittances are increasing and are at levels that are quite significant, very much exceeding aid flows. Government policies are being open to sovereign rating and capital market scrutiny. Information and communication technology is transforming the business landscape, especially in the financial sector. And a growing middle class and young entrepreneurial populations are a driving force for change, enjoying greater economic and democratic freedom. Governments have grown increasingly responsive to the demands of the people for accountability. Above all, civil society and a new generation of policy think tanks all over Africa are taking up advocacy and surveillance roles as to restrain the abuse of power. Africa has been truly rising, and this is a, justifi there is a, and this is a justifiable cause 
for optimism. It offers some encouragement and relief, especially for those who nearly fell into despair and fatigue with international, with structural adjustment and aid dependency. It also justifies the constructive optimism of those who for many years drew professional energy from the belief in the potential of the African region. Yes, you, if you are thinking about me, you, can, you are right. But others also have reasons to share a lingering skepticism, call it Afro-pessimism. This is because for many years, the results that came in were clearly disappointing. And those new results may well be not as robust uh, and they fall far short from meeting the promise and the exuberant expectations aroused by populist leaders at the time of independence. And of course, there, is, there remains the specter of widespread corruption that could retard progress. Mr. Chairman, the current performance of African states and their trajectory on the development path raises the question of whether the glass is half full or half empty. But I think the more fundamental question to ask is whether the glass is, is being filled with the right cocktail of the catalyst needed for sustained growth and whether the glass is robust enough to withstand vibrations in the environment. Clearly, a good cocktail a good cocktail must, include, must exclude any trace of corruption and include a heavy dose of good governance. Good governance is a defining attribute of strong nations and a catalyst for growth. It has been somewhat missing for decades for Af in Af Africa. It has been missing in Africa's nation building process. Corruption is a toxin and it has been ever present and a disruptive factor in Africa's economic performance. So Africa needs leaders who have the genuine intent to fight corruption and would make anti-corruption policies one of the central pillars of a comprehensive development strategy. Anti-corruption policies that are deeply rooted in the laws and values of the society. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to come back to or go back to what I, I have said earlier. Decisions shape the course of history. Good decisions enrich the experience and corruption compromises it. Africa needs sustained development and growth to lift the well-being of, of its people. So good governance must be an imperative object, objective of public policy. Corruption must be uprooted. It must not be entertained in any form. It is up to citizens, you and I, 
to insist on their rights as principals in the game and ensure that good governance practices are followed by their agents, the political leaders and public decision makers. It must be the sacred right of citizens to be alert and to ensure that no one appropriates the public good for personal gain. That is truly the essence of surveillance of the by the citizenry. If the current growth resurgence is to be sustained, the clarion call to public office holders and all participants in the economic system should be thou shall not take corrupt decisions. <laughs> thou shall uphold honesty and integrity. Leaders shall be faithful to their oath of office. Thank you very much for, your, for listening.